Hi, this is uh, Aaron Lacey. Welcome to bringing clarity to the Clary Act. Uh, good, good afternoon, I guess, if you're on the East Coast or in Central Time, and good morning if you're you're west of there. Uh, my name is, like I said, Aaron Lacey. I'm an attorney here at Thompson Coburn LLP. We're a full service law firm. Have uh, uh, close to 400 attorneys these days. Uh, we are based in St. Louis, but have offices in Chicago and Los Angeles, Washington D.C., among others. Um, our higher education practice. Uh, does a number of things. We provide regulatory counsel to folks on federal state accrediting agencies and laws. So that's like say here in the slide, Title IV, Title IX, Clary Act, uh, and federal financial aid obviously is a big specialty including consumer information, things along those lines. Uh, we represent institutions and in student and employee litigation, uh, government investigations and administrative proceedings, audits reviews, so program reviews, things of that nature with the department or uh, complaints or proceedings with state agencies or, or creditors. Uh, and we assist schools with a pretty wide variety of transactions, uh, including sort of day-to-day -day, um, uh, contracts and negotiations, as well as uh, mergers and acquisitions in the, in the case of a, a sale or a merger with another institution. Um, I mentioned earlier, my name is Aaron Lacey. I'm a partner in our higher education practice. Uh, prior to coming to this firm, Thompson Coburn, I uh, spent about four years uh, in-house at a post-secondary institution here in St. Louis and oversaw all their regulatory compliance and government affairs functions. We had about 24 campus locations, uh, so there was a lot to that. Uh, and, and prior to that, I, I spent uh, about eight years in Washington, D.C. as an attorney in, in another higher education practice. So I wanted to start out today, we're, we're going to get into the nuts and bolts here in just a minute, and uh, and actually I, I've intentionally included some slides in this presentation that are, that are a little bit dense. Uh, th there's a reason for that. The thinking is um, that after the webinar is concluded, uh, you all can use the presentation slides as a tool. So you can actually sit down and as you're going through your annual security report or considering your various processes and procedures, uh, you can actually take these slides and have them there and the, the content while it's a little dense for a webinar presentation, will be very useful when you're going through that exercise. So that was intentional. But, but before we get into that, uh, I wanted to take just a minute to talk about what really is an evolving regulatory framework, as I've, I've titled it here, uh, surrounding campus security. Now this, this is a slide that shows up in a lot of my presentations. You all know, or most folks are familiar with the post-secondary triad, as it's called. These are the primary post-secondary regulators uh, with which each institution or post-secondary institution contends. I, I wanted to highlight this slide just to note that in the area of campus security, while accreditors have not had a great deal to say, to date. I mean, obviously they are concerned with your operations and the integrity of your operations and how you treat students and employees. But they've been relatively silent with regard to specific issues of campus security. That is not the case with the states, right? Subsequent to first the Sandusky incident at Penn State, and then in the last couple of years increased attention to campus security, a lot of states have introduced new laws and, and in some cases agency regulations that relate specifically to campus security at post-secondary institutions. I, I highlight this because we're going to focus today on the federal regulation of campus security issues and even more specifically obviously on the Clary Act. But as an administrator at your institution, when you're going through this process uh, and you're trying to get these various procedures and processes up to, up to speed and you're looking through your policies, please be sure to consider whether or not your state agency also has uh, laws and regulations that would be uh, germane. Because if you're not going that last step and looking at the state agencies, you, you may not be completely where you need to be. I say last step, another point I'll make, um, there is so much right now swirling around uh, in, at the regulatory level that relates to campus security, it, it can really be very overwhelming, particularly if you're trying to wrap your head around all of it at once. One thing that I recommend to clients uh, and that may work for the folks uh, attending the webinar today is to pick one of these bodies of law uh, and try to look at your policies and procedures and think about how they shape up relative to that one body of law first and then move to the next sort of sequentially. Now you want to get through all of them before you finalize and publish a policy. But that can be easier than trying to have the Clary Act and your state laws and Title IX and all these things in front of you at once and trying to assimilate it all at the same time. Speaking of 
federal regulatory forces. Uh, I wanted to take just a minute, too, to point out that there are a number of different federal uh, entities, divisions right now that have something to say about campus security. Um, you'll see here in the graph, so the circle in the middle and the four pieces of the pie represent um, the, the laws or the guidance that are out there, and then beyond that you'll see the division or the government entity that's enforcing them. So obviously here in the upper right-hand quadrant you've got the Clary Act. That is enforced by the Clary Act Compliance Division, a, a relatively new division of federal student aid over at the Department of Education. Uh, also uh, influencing this discussion to a great extent uh, is the Office of Civil Rights, which is another division within the United States Department of Education, but is separate from federal student aid and the Clary Act Division, and they enforce a separate law, right, Title IX. So you've got two major players in this conversation, but they are enforcing different laws and they are completely separated in terms of the divisions uh, in the department within which they operate. In addition to that, you've got the White House, also part of the executive structure, but nonetheless separate in terms of its functions and, and sort of its relationship to these other executive agencies. They implemented a couple of years ago or created the Task Force to Protect Students from Sexual Assault. Uh, some of you will be familiar with the uh, 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 policy documents that the task force has, has made available uh, in the last year and a half or so. One of their big roles, uh, the White House has created the Not Alone website, uh, and a lot of the information that the task force has been developing, there are some templates and forms uh, are available on that website. And then finally, Congress, as many folks know, also is involved in this conversation. Um, we're in St. Louis, Senator McCaskill, right here in our home state, along with Senator Gillibrand last year, introduced the Campus Safety and Accountability Act. It was reintroduced this year um, by a bipartisan group of senators and a larger bipartisan group uh, than those that introduced the legislation last year. Uh, and about three weeks ago, I think it was, the House introduced their counterpart to the Campus Safety and Accountability Act. So Congress also is, is part of this conversation. And all of these different entities, um, they are not in perfect coordination. In some cases, they are moving in slightly different directions. Uh, but in others, they are clearly influencing one another. We're going to focus on the Clary Act today. Um, it, it alone is a pretty, pretty uh, sizable chunk to bite off. Um, but when you're thinking about your approach on campus, um, to campus security, you just need to be aware that uh, even at just the federal level, there are a number of conversations taking place. One of the things that I think is useful, and it can be, you know, you look at all those different players that are involved and it can be overwhelming. I, I think one of the things that is useful if you're actually on campus and you're trying to think about how to go about implementing this is to really understand the critical themes, right? What are the things that all of these different bodies are talking about because from a, a uh, risk assessment standpoint, these are going to be the issues that probably are most important for you to address. Uh, certainly if you have these government agencies that come on campus, these are going to be the critical themes that are guiding um, their reviews. The, so right here you'll see in this graph we've got Title IX, Clary, Congress, and the White House. We easily could have done another circle that said you know state agencies, but in the middle you'll see three critical themes. One is victim management meaning how you address and deal with victims when they come forth, uh, and I mean victims of sexual violence, and we'll talk about that term in a minute. Uh, the second is your uh, institutional disciplinary processes. So if you have uh, an incident that has been reported on campus and the institution is investigating and, and then working through a disciplinary process, how does that work? How is it managed? And finally, what kind of training and outreach do you have in place? So what are you doing to make sure that your employees and your staff and your campus community are aware of your various policies, are aware of how to report, uh, how the processes work, those types of things? These are the three issues, in my mind, the three themes that have, that have repeatedly come up and about which the press and the folks inside the Beltway and elsewhere uh, ha have really been most concerned. So today, as I go through the new Clary Act regulations, we'll talk about things that fall slightly outside of these themes, but a lot of the conversation is going to be guided by these primary concerns. All right, so let's jump into uh, some of the nuts and bolts. 
the origin story of the Clary Act. Um, it's part of the Higher Education Act. I think most folks know that, so it's just a component of the HEA. It was enacted in 1990. Originally, it was not called the Gene Clary Act, so it's a little older than some people may realize. And the purpose was to provide students, employees, and the public increased transparency regarding campus safety and security. Um, some important notes, it applies to all institutions participating in the federal financial aid programs. Uh, it has been amended and expanded on multiple occasions, and I highlight that because uh, it's a little bit of a contrast, say, to Title IX, where the law itself has not been amended that many times, uh, at least not in recent years, and what you really see there is a, a proliferation of sub-regulatory guidance. Um, so you've got the Office of Civil Rights issuing you know, policy documents and, and through enforcement actions giving people an idea of what they're looking for. Um, the Clary Act, the, the statute itself and the regulations have been amended and changed on a number of occasions, even just in the last decade. Uh, and it is presently enforced again by the Clary Act Compliance Division of Federal Student Aid, so a different division from the Office of Civil Rights. I usually think of Clary obligations as falling into four big buckets, and, and even more generally I find when you're dealing with a set of regulations, whether it be Gainful Employment or the Clary Act or Title IX, it's helpful to, at a high level, sort of conceptualize the different divisions or components of the regulatory scheme. So in the case of the Clary Act, there are four. One is to prepare and report your crime and fire statistics. Fire statistics, if you have um, on, on campus, or, or student housing, I should say. Uh, you have to publish an annual security report, and again, if you have student housing, an annual fire safety report, including uh, requisite poly policy information. So folks who've done this or are already responsible for this at their institutions know that in the annual security report has become a um, quite an involved affair, and certainly these regulations are, are making it even more detailed and more involved. Uh, you have to maintain a crime log. And finally, implement timely warning, emergency notification, and missing person procedures. And that last missing person procedures, again, only apply if you have student housing. So the student housing specific elements are the, the fire statistics, the fire report, and missing person procedures. If you don't have student housing, you probably, well, you do not have to deal with any of those, and my guess is you probably don't. Uh, in 2013, the source of these new regulations was the March 2013 Reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act, uh, VAWA, as it is acronymed and often referred to. Um, it amended the Clary Act primarily in two ways. Uh, one, it required folks to compile statistics concerning sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking. Right? I'm going to refer to those four concepts throughout the rest of this presentation generally as sexual violence so that we don't have to keep re restating all four of those. But those are the four key components that are really a part of this conversation that were introduced in VAWA and now are sort of at the core of all these new regulations, sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking. So in addition to requiring that, that institutions start compiling statistics relating to these different areas of sexual violence, VAWA also uh, required institutions in their annual security report to include policies and procedures and programs concerning these types of crimes of sexual violence. And, and those, those requirements in VAWA were, um, while only uh, representing a few words, if you actually look at a red line of the statutes, there, there wasn't that much new language introduced, but conceptually it was a pretty big change. Right? Because if you remember back, we were talking about the purpose of the Clary Act when it was first introduced. It was, it was about really the crime statistics and, and increasing transparency. VAWA sort of reconceptualized Clary in the sense that it started putting an affirmative obligation on institutions to increase not just uh, their disclosure processes and their gathering and reporting of statistics, but really um, their active efforts, uh, much like Title IX, to manage folks when they report these types of crimes, to make sure that disciplinary proceedings are, are managed in a certain way, to increase training and outreach, all of those types of things. So these are obligations that um, sort of philosophically were new to the Clary Act. Timelines and implementation. In October 2014 is when the department, so last October, promulgated the new regulations to carry out VAWA. So the, in 2013 when VAWA was reauthorized, those statutes immediately became effective. And the expectation was that institutions would immediately thereafter begin updating the policies and the procedures. The department came out and said, look, we, we know it's going to be a challenge with regard to the statistics, so you need to make a good faith effort when you report your statistics for 2013 and 2014 to comply with the statutory changes in VAWA. 
So the new regulations become effective this July 1, 2015, so just right around the corner. And, and they expand pretty significantly uh, upon the VAWA themes. And, and I want to make a point of that because if you in mid-2013 or 2014 sat down with the statute and said these are the changes that have occurred to the Clary Act itself, the, statute, the statutes, and you made sure that your policies were all revised and up to date, you still need to sit down and look at the new regulations because the regulations in a number of places uh, expand and change processes. They add more definition. They add additional guidance. They go well beyond um, what you had to do just to become into compliance with the statutory changes. Uh, so please, if, even if you went through that exercise, take some time to sit down with these regulations and make sure that you make any additional revisions or changes that you need to make to be in compliance. Um, institutions are not required to revise their calendar year 13 and calendar year 14 statistics to reflect these final regulations that are going to affect. So in other words, if you made a good faith effort, and hopefully you did, for calendar year 13 and 14 to gather information on the sexual violence crimes and report that information uh, consistent with the statutory changes, you're in good shape. You don't have to retroactively go back now that the regulations have come out and added this new guidance and clarity, go back and revise your old statistics. You don't have to do that. But the statistics for CY15 should be compliant. And this is an important point. So we're in 2015 right now. This October, you're going to be reporting your calendar year 14 statistics, right? So the first year you'll have to report statistics that are compliant with the new regulations is next year, October 1st, 2016. But remember, those will be statistics for calendar year 15, and we're in the middle of it. So as you're gathering statistics this year, from already from January through the end of this year, you need to be gathering statistics that are consistent in your mechanism for gathering and interpreting these crimes and determining whether they need to be reported, those do need to be consistent with these new regulations because the expectation will be when you report statistics for calendar year 15, even though that's not until next October, you're already in the process right now of, of you know, people are coming to you and reporting these, these incidents and you're having to make a determination. Is this something that is dating violence? Is this domestic violence, et cetera? So just keep in mind, the new regs become effective this July 1, but you really already should be trying to put into place processes for gathering uh, information consistent with these regs for calendar year 15, so that when you report them next year, October 1, 16, you'll be in good shape. The other thing you should recognize is that was, you know, we're talking about the statistics, the policies and the processes, the training and outreach programs, to the extent the new regulations uh, talk about all those changes, those need to be put into place uh, as soon as you can, right, because those laws all become effective July 1 of this year. All right, so let's talk about the changes to the reporting requirements. Reporting sexual violence, okay, so you have to include statistics for incidents of domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking that are reported to campus security authorities or local law enforcement. So you, part of the process of dealing with Clary Act, and this isn't new, is, is assigning and determining who are your campus security authorities. If something is reported, if one of these incidents is reported to campus security authorities or local law enforcement, then you're supposed to include it as a statistic. So you include reports of crimes made and calls for service, complaints or investigations, any of those contexts. It does not matter if the crime's reported by the victim or a third party. And also, it doesn't matter if a prosecutor or a court or someone else uh, other than the ultimately determined that the crime did not occur, right? So remember, and this goes for all Clary reporting, not, not just the sexual incidents of sexual violence. It doesn't matter if a court actually determined that it occurred or didn't occur. It's just if it's reported to a campus security authority or local law enforcement. You, you want to make sure you're using the correct definitions of domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking. Uh, and that's right now, remember this year as you're collecting this information, you want to go ahead and make sure you understand those definitions and you're gathering uh, uh, information consistent with those definitions. Um, the definitions for most crimes in Clary are from the FBI's Uniform Crime Reporting System. And if you look at Appendix A to the Clary Act regs, the Clary Act regs are in 668.46, which is uh, um, in subpart D. If you look at Appendix A to 34 CFR 668 subpart D, it has definitions of all these crimes, right? So it's actually in the law. They're, they're right there. But the definitions for the sexual violence terms, right, domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking, are defined at 
A, and they're different. They're not from the FBI's Uniform Crime Reporting System. They are not in Appendix A, right? They are right there in the regs. So you need to make sure you've got the right definitions. Also, include those definitions in your letter to, letter to local law enforcement when you solicit crime statistics each year, right? I mean, the only way that those guys are going to know what you're requesting and what you need, and also if you're ever subject to a program review, the only way you can demonstrate that you ask for the right thing is if you actually include those definitions in the letter that you send to local law enforcement each year when you're trying to gather your crime statistics. Local law enforcement is going to be familiar with the FBI's Uniform Crime Reporting System, so we don't typically include definitions of every single crime in that letter. But they're not necessarily going to be familiar with the specific terms for sexual violence that are in 668-46A. So my recommendation is that you take those definitions and you drop them into your letter. And that way, and sometimes this happens, you'll get a, you know, a, an email back from local law enforcement and they'll say, we have nothing to report. Well, when the department comes and does a program review, if all you've got is that email that says we have nothing to report, the department has no way of knowing if you actually ask for the right stuff. So not only do you want to include those definitions in your letter and make sure your letter goes out to local law enforcement, keep a copy of that letter and, and put it next to the response down the road. Uh, that will put you in a much better position if you're ever in some sort of audit or review situation. Um, be aware that the list of forcible and non-forcible sex offenses has been replaced. So for years, we have been reporting to the department um, under primary offenses, there was a category of sex offenses, and that broke down into uh, about six different things, forcible and non-forcible. That's all been replaced. So now there are only four categories of sex offense, rape, fondling, incest, and statutory rape. And going forward for on October 1st, 2016, when you report the statistics for CY15, calendar year 15, you're just going to report these new four uh, for these new four items. The, the department uh, indicated they did this because it more closely aligns with the updated FBI definitions. Picture's worth a thousand words. So here you go on the left, you see in 2012, so this was before the VAWA statutory changes and before these new regulations. When you were reporting on sex offenses, here, here were your six, right? Forcible rape, forcible sodomy, sexual assault with an object, forcible fondling, incest, Statutory rape, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, I got that right. And there were none of the new VAWA crimes, right? For 13 and 14, this was after the statutory changes were made, and the department, remember, the expectation was that you would make a good faith effort to collect and report statistics for these calendar years consistent with the VAWA changes. So you still had the same six under sex offenses, and then you had the three new ones that VAWA put into place, dating violence, domestic violence, stalking. For calendar year 2015, which you'll report on October 1st, 2016, in that annual security report, right? Sex offenses is now just these four, rape, fondling, incest, statutory rape. That also is the definition, incidentally, of sexual assault, which has been introduced in these Clary regs, right, and by, by VAWA. There's this new concept, sexual assault, and these are the four elements of sexual assault. And in addition, you will still be gathering and reporting on the, the VAWA crimes, as I'm calling them, dating violence, domestic violence, and stalking. Hopefully this, this chart will help you understand the changes uh, over this period and what you're gathering and reporting on. Use an expanded definition of hate crime. Just note, um, you know, you have certain reporting obligations if a crime occurs and that crime is a hate crime. Uh, formally, the, what constituted a hate crime, it, it, it was a crime that, was, uh, a, that involved someone or someone acted on certain uh, categories of bias. VAWA added national origin and gender identity to the categories previously listed in that definition. So now the eight categories of bias that would constitute a hate crime, right, are race, gender, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, ethnicity, or disability. Those really were, were changes that should have influenced your reporting for 13 and 14 as well because those were changes made by VAWA. If you didn't get the changes made previously, just be aware um, so that you can do it going forward. And then, I, you know, this is sort of a soft recommendation, but, but I, I wanted to encourage folks to recognize the idiosyncrasies of sexual violence reporting. And what I mean by that is um, with some of the crimes that previously – have been uh, for, for which we previously have reported as institutions. Um, whether or not the crime occurred or didn't occur was uh, relatively straightforward. I mean, you knew what the definition was, and someone came to you, and you could identify pretty readily if this was the type of crime that you had to report. 
Sexual violence, these specific crimes, right, domestic uh, violence, dating violence, stalking, are a little different. And it's important to understand the subtleties of these definitions and how they can impact uh, whether or not something that's been reported actually constitutes a crime and, and how you should go about marking it and then reporting it going forward. Uh, you, we could do an entire presentation on this. The Clary Center uh, has a one-hour presentation on YouTube just about stalking. Right. So rather than try to dig into the weeds on these, my general advice is just look at these definitions and the regulations and try to appreciate their subtleties. And if you like, you can, you know, you can look at additional resources like those available at the Clary Center, et cetera. If you wanted to do a deep dive on some of these specific issues, I uh, wrote a couple of blog posts last year that dealt with stalking and a couple of these, and I expect to be writing a little bit in the future. But just be aware of that, and I'll give you some examples. So, for example, dating violence requires romantic or an, a romantic or intimate relationship and excludes mental abuse. So if somebody comes to you and makes a report, whether or not it constituted dating violence will turn on whether or not you as an institution determined that there was, in fact, a romantic or intimate relationship present. Right, So that's sort of a subtlety there. And also, someone might come and report violence that occurred in the context of a romantic or intimate relationship. But if that violence that they reported was only mental abuse and no physical abuse, it wouldn't qualify as dating violence, and that's, that's in the regulation. Um, any reported incident qualifying as both domestic violence and dating violence is only reported once as domestic violence. And that's, that's just the department has made that determination because they feel like uh, dating violence is a subset of domestic violence, right? Uh, in counting instances of sexual violence involving murder, which hopefully would be very rare and not occur on, on most people's campuses or anyone's campus, I should say. But you should know if that happened, the hierarchy rule, which typically dictates that where you have multiple crimes that occurred simultaneously, you only report the highest level crime. In this case, the department said we don't want it to apply. So if a victim is murdered and sexually assaulted in a single incident, which incidentally is what happened to Jean Clary, right, was the, uh, the, one of the driving forces behind this whole set of laws, you have to report both the murder and the sexual assault in your statistics. This is just an idiosyncrasy. It's just something that the department has determined, but it's important that you be aware that there are, there are little things like this that are out there. Um, and finally, I, I mentioned that the Clary Center has done a whole hour on stalking. Stalking is complicated. It is not like typical crimes, and here's why. All the other crimes happen in one place at one time. But stalking involves a course of conduct, right? So stalking could involve four or five instances that occur in different places over different periods of time. So there, there become these challenges in determining, well, so when we report it, where do we report it occurred? And when do we report that it occurred? What if the stalking started in one calendar year and ended in another calendar year? Right, So there are little complications that arise when you're trying to figure out how to wrestle with stalking, and you should be aware of those and think a little bit about them. Read the regulation and the guidance surrounding the reporting of stalking uh, so that if you have someone who comes and reports stalking, you can make a determination, one, as to whether it occurred uh, as defined in the regulations, and two, how to properly go about reporting it. All right, so now I want to focus on the three themes that I talked about early on, victim management, the disciplinary process, and training and outreach. And these three themes, about 95% of the new regulations, virtually everything that doesn't go to statistical reporting, falls into these, these three broad categories. So in your annual security report, we're talking about victim management right now. First, rights and options. Your annual security report has to describe procedures that the institution will follow and that victims should follow when sexual violence is reported. And remember, sexual violence is my general term for domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and, uh, and stalking. So here are the things that you have to include when you're talking about those procedures. How and to whom an alleged offense should be reported, very straightforward how evidence will be pres preserved, and why preservation is important. Um, so, for example, why would be proving an alleged offense occurred uh, because it's necessary to assist in obtaining a protection order, but you need to discuss in your annual security report these notions of the preservation of, uh, of evidence. You need to lay out the victim's options for involving campus authorities or local law enforcement. And local law enforcement here, we mean on campus or local police, but campus authorities is separate. So you've got the non-legal option, the campus authorities, or local law enforcement. That's the legal option, whether they be on campus or off campus. You need to include and discuss for a victim their options to notify these various authorities. 
to not notify, in other words, make clear that they have that as a choice, or to be assisted with the notification process and how to do that. Victims' rights and institutions' responsibilities for orders of protection, no contact orders, restraining orders, are similar lawful orders issued by a criminal, civil, or tribal court or by the institution. So this is a lot, but this discussion in your annual security report about these topics is one of those things that all of those federal regulatory parties and the state parties that we mentioned earlier that are concerned with these themes, this is the discussion they're concerned, or one of the pieces of the discussion they're concerned has not been taking place, right? Where they feel like institutions have not been getting the job done because they feel like folks who are victimized and want to come forward don't know the answers to these questions. So this is why they've mandated that these things be included in an annual security report, and it's why you need to make sure that you're discussing these different topics in your annual security report. They're not dictating necessarily how you go about these things or the answers to these topics, right? It's going to differ from institution to institution, you know, what the options are, how and to whom they should be reported, but, but um, thematically these points should be covered. The annual security report, ASR, as I've, I've paraphrased it, also needs to describe how an institution will protect the confidentiality of victims and other parties. This has also been a very hot topic in this space as folks have been talking about campus security. Um, so they want to make sure that you're talking and you're, you're describing and explaining to victims as they come forward uh, how you're going to keep their information confidential, even in the context of completing publicly available record keeping. So your Clary Act reporting, for example, uh, you need to discuss in your annual security report how you will preserve the confidentiality of a victim even when carrying out your responsibilities under the Clary Act to report uh, uh, various statistics and make disclosures, and also how you're going to preserve confidentiality um, even when you're providing accommodations or other protective measures uh, to the extent that you can. Services and accommodations. So, and this is a little different. You'll notice I'm going to flip back to the prior slide. So for confidentiality, rights, and options, your, your annual security report has to actually describe how you're going to do these things. With services and accommodations, it's a little different. The legal requirement under the new regs is that the annual security report has to state that you will provide notice to students and employees regarding these topics. So you don't have to describe in great detail necessarily all of the support services, for example, but you do have to state in the ASR that you will provide notice to individuals regarding support services in the event that they come forward and report uh, uh, sexual violence. Um, so you have to, uh, State that you'll provide notice regarding the rights, options, and confidentiality. Of course, as we just discussed, you also have to actually discuss those things in the ASR. Then you have to include a statement saying you'll provide notice uh, regarding support services, including counseling, health, mental health, victim advocacy, et cetera, et cetera. And, and also, you need to, if you're not going to describe these things in your annual security report, what that means is you've got to have a separate notice, and somewhere you've also got to have this information available so that you can actually provide it to these individuals when they come forward. Uh, and then accommodations and protective measures. So you've got to state in your ASR, if someone comes forward uh, or reports something to us, we will provide the written notification to them regarding what accommodations and protective measures are available, including their options for assistance, uh, to request changes in academic living, transportation, or working situations, et cetera. And you also have to describe the range of protective measures. The other thing I wanted to notice, because this isn't just a, a requirement that you include something in your ASR, this is actually an affirmative obligation that's been placed upon institutions. Uh, in the, the new regulations clearly state that an institution must make accommodations or provide protective measures if the victim requests them and if they are reasonably available. So there is a, there's a standard there. You have this reasonably available standard. Um, but but there is an affirmative obligation on on institutions if someone comes forward to actually make accommodations or provide protective measures. And it doesn't matter whether the victim chooses to report the crime that allegedly occurred to local law enforcement. That has no impact on your obligation to provide accommodations and services that are reasonably available. All right, so that's that's the victim management portion. Now let's talk about the disciplinary process. The first thing you have to do is in your ASR, you've got to communicate uh, and describe the various disciplinary processes for matters involving allegations of sexual violence. You need to describe uh, how someone can file a complaint relating to sexual violence. So, and that's similar to in the prior category, you know, uh, making sure that you were telling folks how to report, right, how and when to report. Um, 
you need to describe each type of disciplinary proceeding used by the institution uh, in, in matters involving allegations of sexual violence. So what the law here is contemplating is the possibility that you would have a different process for an allegation involving rape, for example, uh, the, as opposed to a process involving stalking or dating violence or something like that. You don't have to. There's nothing mandating that you have lots of different disciplinary proceedings. You could have just one. But, but some institutions choose to manage uh, different uh, allegations in different ways because they feel like the nature of the underlying allegations um, warrants some, some subtle differences. Um, steps, anticipated timelines, and decision-making processes for each type of disciplinary proceeding. So let's assume for a minute you just have one. You still have to describe each of these things about that process. Um, how the institution determines which type of proceeding to use based on specific allegations, right? So if you do have different proceedings, you have to explain how the institution is going to determine which one applies. Uh, the standard of evidence that will be used, and, and as a lot of folks know, this is a Title IX intersection um, where uh, the folks at the Office of Civil Rights have said that you should use a preponderance of the evidence standard um, when dealing with allegations of sexual violence, which, of course, is different from the uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt standard used, for example, in, in the criminal context, right? And then finally, you have to articulate the possible sanctions um, that could apply to an individual um, if after a hearing there was a, a determination um, that, that something did in fact occur. Prompt, fair, and impartial process. So institutions also under the new regulations are required to guarantee that their proceedings will constitute prompt, fair, and impartial processes. And that is defined in the regulations as a process that is completed within a reasonably prompt time frame allows for the extension of time frames for good cause with written notice to the accuser and the accused of the delay and the reason for the delay, and is consistent with the institution's policies and transparent to the accuser and the accused. Now, what's interesting is the, the requirements that you provide or guarantee that your process will be prompt, fair, and impartial, um, I, I don't know that the law specifically says that you have to state that that means that the process will will uh, provide for these different bullets, but I probably would. I would probably just say, since that's the definition, and my annual security report advised that we're going to, uh, you know, our processes are prompt, fair, and impartial, and that means that they will X, Y, Z. I said X, Y, Z. Really, it's A, B, C, and X, Y, Z. So there are three more points that go into being a prompt, fair, and impartial process. It includes timely notice of meetings at which the accuser or accused are both may be present, provides timely and equal access to the accuser and the accused and appropriate officials to any information that will be used during informal and formal disciplinary meetings and hearings, and finally is conducted by officials who do not have a conflict of interest or bias for or against the accuser or the accused. And officials, by the way, and I'll talk about this a little later on, but I mean that could be teachers, uh, you know, it's professors, that's staff, that's administrators, that's students, anyone who is an official in one of these hearings right? Part of the guarantee here is that they will not have a conflict of interest or bias. So if you have professors or students on your hearing panels, um, you're going to have to pay attention to whether or not someone could argue there's a conflict of interest or bias if they have any type of relationship with the, with the individuals who are involved. Speaking of hearing officials, the annual security report also is required to state and, and what that means is institutions also are required essentially to guarantee that the officials who, who oversee these hearings will, at a minimum, receive annual training on sexual violence issues and how to conduct an investigation and hearing process that protects victims and promotes accountability. So whoever you've got sitting on that board or, or on your, you know, your hearing panel, again, whether that be a student or, or a staff member, um, you're going to have to have a process to ensure that they have received the annual training that's required, and it has to be specific. There are a lot of vendors right now. Uh, I think the Clary Center has some of this kind of training. I'm not sure the department does, but a lot of folks who have created modules and training opportunities specifically um, to try to get uh, hearing officials with this responsibility up to speed. Um, but you, whatever your processes are, you need to include this language in your SR, and you need to make sure that you've come up with some way to make sure that these folks will have that requisite training. Representatives and advisors. So the annual security report has to state that the process will provide the accuser and the accused with the same opportunities 
to have others present during any institutional disciplinary proceeding, that you will not limit the choice of advisor or presence for either the accused or the accuser in any meeting or institutional disciplinary proceeding, and that the institution can restrict an advisor's participation in proceedings as long as restrictions apply equally. I've, I've underlined some points here because there are some subtleties that it's important that you, know, that, that you, you absorb and that aren't missed. Um, so for example, the law doesn't require that you provide folks with an advisor or that you permit them even to have an advisor. It, it, it requires that you provide them the same opportunity to have someone present during an institutional disciplinary proceeding. This is also consistent with Title IX. I was at another conference not too long ago, and, and this question came up as to whether or not you know, institutions now had to provide everyone with an advisor or, or guarantee them the right to an advisor, and that is not what the law requires. The focus of the law is to ensure that both parties have similar, or, or I should say the same, not similar, but the same opportunities. You can't limit the choice of advisor or presence Right, So if you permit them to have one, you can't limit their choice and say, well, you can have this person but not this person. But you could just outright say, no, you, neither party gets an advisor. I don't know that that's the right way to go, but I just, again, want to highlight the subtlety in, in, this, in this requirement. Um, and then even if you do permit them to have one, again, you can restrict their participation. You just have to do it equally for both sides. Um, results and appeals. So finally, uh, your annual security report has to state that the institution will simultaneously notify the accuser and the accused in writing of the result of any institutional disciplinary proceeding that arises from an allegation of sexual violence, the institution's procedures for the accused and the victim to appeal the result of the institutional disciplinary proceeding if such procedures are available. So again, they're not mandating that you provide an appeal, but they are requiring that if an appeal is available, that those procedures have to be uh, provided to the individuals and provided simultaneously. Uh, any change to the result and when such results become final. So the emphasis here is on ensuring that the parties are getting relevant information and that they're getting that information at the same time in a fair way, not on requiring institutions to necessarily adopt a specific appeal process or any appeal process at all. All right, training and outreach. So this is the final of the, the three big themes. And this has been, I should just take a step back and say, this has been another point, like the other two themes, that has seriously concerned the folks inside the Beltway. The, the feeling is, and, and this has been repeated um, by the folks who introduced the, the Campus Accountability Safety Act, that institutions have not been doing a very good job of providing training and programs uh, to individuals in the campus community that will help them understand their options and their rights and the nature of these specific incidents and, and to try to encourage the prevention of sexual violence on campus. The feeling has been generally that this hasn't been occurring. I, you know, I, I don't know that that's true. I think there are many, many schools out there, um, if not a majority, that before all of this really came to the forefront over the last 12 or 24 months, already we're doing a lot of great work. But the fact is there now are many more programs and modules available. A lot of schools have increased their efforts to provide preventative and ongoing training. Um, if you are not doing much in, in this regard right now, I encourage you to think about it, not only because it's a good thing, but also because it is of a major concern to your regulators and it is clearly expected under both the CLARE Act and Title IX. Um, so, so this is one of those areas of focus that when you're sitting down and thinking about what are we doing, what do we need to do, um, programs and training should be a primary area of focus. Um, so the annual security report specifically has to describe an institution's programs to prevent sexual violence. Okay, Programs should be, and this is pursuant to the definition of, of programs to prevent sexual violence in, in, the, in the regulations. The expectation is that these programs will be comprehensive, intentional, and integrated, right? That they will be culturally relevant, inclusive of diverse communities and identities, sustainable, responsive to community needs, so there is no one size fits all, that's not the idea, and informed by research or assessed for value, effectiveness, or outcome, not both, but one or the other, so they should be informed by research or assessed for value, and would and consider environmental risk and protective factors as they occur on the individual relationship, institutional, community, and societal levels. Now, this is a tall order. I get that. But, but it's worth including this definition so that folks appreciate 
at least what the expectation of the Department of Education is, right? I don't know if they come on campus and do a program review how seriously they are going to look to see and whether or not they would try to make a determination as to whether or not your specific programs were, for example, sustainable, right? But it is worth understanding that this is not just a throwaway requirement in the regulations. Clearly the expectation is that the programming and the training that you're providing uh, is substantial and, and well thought out. The ASR breaks into, and the new regulations break training and outreach really into two parts. The first relates specifically to programs for new students and employees, by the way. Please keep in mind, and I think sometimes I know compliance folks uh, often, the federal financial aid folks often appreciate that some of these requirements apply to both students and employees, but I've also found over the years that at the uh, executive level, the general counsel level, that sometimes can be a surprise because these folks think of these requirements as coming up through federal financial aid, and so they think of them primarily as, as applying to students. But as you know, and hopefully you're already providing notice of your annual security report to you know, students and employees, um, these requirements are intended to benefit your entire campus community, right? I mean, we not the idea from a policy standpoint is not only that you're making your campus a safer place for students, but for everybody who's on the campus. So programs for training and outreach are supposed to be directed not just at new students, but also at new employees. Um, so when you're talking about the new stuff, the ASR, uh, has to include and describe your primary prevention and awareness programs for new students and employees, and those programs should be informed by research or assessed for value, mentioned that earlier. They should be intended to stop sexual violence before it occurs, so thematically when you're thinking about the purpose of them. Uh, they should promote positive and healthy behaviors that foster healthy, mutually respectful relationships and sexuality, et cetera, and disseminate victim management uh, and disciplinary proceedings. Right, um, so all of those things we talked about earlier um, that related to victim management and all those rights and confidentiality and all of those things should be included in your programming is the point here is that these programs should include that information as well. More specifically, the, the annual security report description of these programs for new students and employees should include a statement that the institution prohibits sexual violence, crimes, as those terms are defined in the regulations. It should include the definition of those terms. Uh, in the applicable jurisdiction. The definition of consent in reference to sexual activity in the applicable jurisdiction. A description of safe and positive options for bystander intervention. Bystander intervention has been a big deal. It's been a topic of, uh, of conversation. Um, uh, the It's On Us campaign launched by the White House is really trying to encourage bystander intervention and there's a definition of bystander intervention in the regulations. Information on risk reduction, there's also a definition of risk reduction in the new regulations. And finally, again, you should cross-reference to the victim management and disciplinary process information that's in the annual security report. Ongoing programs, okay. So we talked about what you need to include for your programs for new students and employees. You also have to have ongoing prevention and training programs for students and employees. Um, the ASR should describe the ongoing programs and that should include um, that they are sustained over time and focused on increasing understanding of topics relevant to and skills for addressing sexual violence, and they should include all the same information in the other programs for new, new employees and uh, students. So once you develop your training programs for new employees and students, um, really you just want your ongoing program to contain most of the same information. Just quickly, I wanted to let you know, um, so that's the end of the, the presentation. I wanted to cover a couple of resources, and then I also was going to take a couple of questions. I think we have time here. Um, we do this blog. It's our regulation, regulation blog um, where we cover various regulatory and policy insights and, and higher ed or offer insights. Um, I've written about Clary Act and other folks here have in the past, and I expect we will be doing so in the future as well as um, some Title IX stuff. So you can always check out our blog, uh, and, and if you want to be on our email list, shoot me an email, and, and I'm happy to add you about once a quarter or so. We'll send out a, an email that just says, hey, here are the you know, blog articles we've written in the last couple, three months. Um, this webinar will be available uh, uh, probably in about a week to 10 days on our website, on demand. It's free, so if you want to listen to it again, you're obviously very welcome to do so. We'd be happy for you to. Um, also, I wanted to point out, you know, there are a lot of external resources popping up relating, external meaning to, to 
Thompson Coburn. So aside from the stuff I just covered out there, there are a lot of different resources popping up, and, and it can be a little overwhelming. In fact, uh, about a year ago, Inside Higher Ed actually did an article entirely dedicated to discussing the cottage industry that has, that has sprung up um, to try to provide services to colleges and universities, other institutions relating to campus securities. And it can be tough to sort of sort through everything. You know, if you take this presentation and you read the regulations, that should get you a long, uh, a good part of the way there, at least with regard to Clary Act. Um, the two other places I would recommend that you look, where you can probably get everything else you need, First is Federal Student Aid's Campus Security website, and I put the link right there. They've got a couple of training modules. Right now, they have still up the 2011 handbook uh, for campus security. Um, they are expected to update that. They have said they're working to update it. When the new handbook comes out, for those who haven't seen it before, it's sort of like the Federal Student Aid handbook. I mean, it's intended to cover everything you need to know relating to Clary Act, so that will be a tremendous resource. Keep an eye on it. I'm sure it will be announced if you're signed up for my IFAP. It'll you know, there'll be an electronic announcement that comes up that says, hey, the new handbook's available. I'd look for that in the next six months. The other place I, I like is the Clary Center for Security on, on campus. Th this is the nonprofit organization that was founded by the parents of Gene Clary. Right? They are a major player. They go around the country doing all kinds of training. They post free training to YouTube. They've got all kinds of materials and resources uh, available on their website. So between those two, really, if you, if you devour the stuff that's available on those websites, you'll, you ought to have everything you need. Right. If you're trying to do this stuff yourself, I mean, if you really, if you want to hire somebody else to come help you, that's different. But to the extent you're just trying to gather information to guide you in managing these issues internally, this really should give you the resources that you need. This is my contact information. Um, we have about six minutes, so let me. Uh, folks have been uh, posting some questions. Um, let me look through some of them. So let's see. What is the definition of consent? under the new regulations? Interesting question. Um, so the department actually presented a, a draft definition of consent at, at one point during the negotiated rulemaking process. And because I'm always prepared, not always, but hopefully frequently, I actually have a copy of it right here. Let me see. So the definition was the affirmative, unambiguous, and voluntary agreement to engage in a specific sexual activity during a sexual encounter. And that's in the uh, preamble to the final regulations. But, but here's the important point. The department ultimately concluded not to include this definition in the new regulations. So let me repeat, there is not a definition of consent in the new Clary Act regulations. And the reason they made that determination, and this is also discussed in the preamble, they said, look, at the end of the day, you don't need a definition of consent to carry out your Clary Act responsibilities, which may seem surprising. You say, well, how, how can that be? Because remember, when you're gathering and reporting your crime statistics, it's not based on whether ultimately it was determined that there was a crime. It's just based on whether or not it was reported. And so the issue of consent doesn't come up when you're just trying to determine whether or not um, something was reported, right? I mean, when somebody shows up and they report it, it's done. If it meets the definition of dating violence, domestic violence, et cetera, sexual violence, um, sexual assault, then, then it's been reported. It's a, it's a qualifying crime, and you include it in your statistics. Now, you may need a definition of consent for your disciplinary hearing folks, right, when they're trying to consider whether or not something actually occurred and you need to take action against the, the, uh, the accused. But um, you, you can use any definition of consent that you like at that point. Now, the department has said if you want to use our definition, and that's why they included it in the preamble, you're welcome to do that. But you can develop a definition for your institutional disciplinary proceedings. And again, you don't have to use theirs, and they don't feel like you need a federal definition of consent um, to satisfy or carry out your Clery Act requirements. All right, here's another one. How on earth – I like that. I like that on earth was included. How on earth – is an institution supposed to know if two students are in a dating relationship? I talked about this a little bit earlier. So it's the, it's the institution's determination, and that's an important point, right, as to whether or not um, a, an intimate relationship exists that would qualify the violence as um, uh, dating violence. So the department's guidance, there are a couple of things. One is um, they say you're supposed to base your determination on the reporting party's characterization. So whatever, you know, however the victim uh, characterizes 
um, the the relationship, or if a third party were to report the the um, the dating violence, how they would characterize the relationship. But the other thing that's really important to note here uh, is that the department has encouraged institutions um, to err on the side of assuming that the victim and the perpetrator are in a dating relationship. Right. So in other words, they're sort of saying give the benefit of the doubt to the idea that they were in a dating relationship because we would rather that you over-report or include something than not include something or under-report. And that may be tough. I don't know how many instances of dating violence will pop up at an institution. Um, but just remember the department has gone on record as saying we think you should lean more towards including it and finding a dating relationship to be there uh, than not. Let's see. Does the department recommend any specific prevention or training programs? Um, not, not to my knowledge, and, uh, and I don't think they probably would. I, I think for a number of reasons that would become problematic. Um, I mean, I don't want to say never say never, but, but, but you can understand why endorsing folks could be an issue for the department. Um, and it's also important to note that, the, that there's a, institutions have a lot of flexibility here with regard to um, the types of prevention and training programs that they, they put into place. Uh, in fact, the department has gone on record again in the preamble as saying that um, th they do not mandate the specific content, or I think they even say they don't have the authority to mandate the specific content of these programs. Now, they've said sort of categorically that there are certain things that each of these programs needs to include, but when it comes to the specific content in each of your programs, um, they, they don't dictate that and they don't dictate the mode of delivery. So it can be done, you know, on a, theoretically, you could you know record it like a lot of the sexual harassment videos. Many of us, when we've become employed, have watched. You could do uh, you know an online training module, something like that. Um, and they don't they don't get into the mode of delivery either. Um, third party vendors are are okay. Uh, you know the department understands a lot of institutions will be looking to folks uh, that are designing and providing modules. There is an expectation though, and I want to emphasize this on the part of the department that. Um, that institutions in designing, uh, in determining goals for their programs and, and, and uh, designing these programs will work with local specialists, right? I, I mean, I don't know that the department would ever actually tag someone as being out of compliance because you used a module developed by a national entity. I mean, I find that sort of hard to believe. But, but clearly, the theme here in the regulations, because it's said at multiple points, and folks inside the Beltway, just you know, sort of the talking heads, have also reiterated that there there's a real need for institutions to work, and they're encouraging institutions to work with you know local rape crisis centers, local sexual assault coalitions, folks in the area. And the thinking there, in large part, is that you know these types of issues tend, in some ways, to be driven by and reflect the circumstances of your community. So if you're working with local folks who are familiar or more familiar with the issues specific to your geographic region, then you're going to come up with programs and training that are more meaningful and more likely ultimately to achieve the whole purpose of the campus security regulatory framework. Um, I, I, one more, one quick one, let's see. So now we have to allow students to have lawyers during their school proceedings, question mark? No. So I mentioned that earlier. You, you do not. You just have to make sure that access, um, what, if you do permit folks to have advisors uh, or, or attorneys or whatever, um, that you have to, uh, they have to have equal access to do so, right? So thanks to everybody. Really appreciate your time. Again, I'll put in one more plug. If you if you get the um, sort of the the post webinar survey and you can take a few minutes and you do have um, any type of feedback, we prefer constructive, but we'll take anything uh, that you want to provide. It is appreciated because again, we we review the comments and we want to make these webinars and presentations um, as as valuable to you all as they possibly can be. Um, thank you again for taking time. I wish you good luck and Godspeed with putting these uh, uh, regulations into play. I, I know there's a lot to absorb. And again, my recommendation is maybe start um, with looking at Clary Act when you're thinking these things through and then move on to Title IX uh, and then maybe look at your state regs. But I encourage folks to think about doing things somewhat uh, more sequentially than trying to get your head around it all at once um, because I think that's likely to just give you a headache. Um, so thank you again and have a great afternoon. We really appreciate you attending.